Welcome back to the latest episode of the Flex Success Podcast, where we teach you how to be less shit. As always, we will be your co-hosts. I'm Lizzie, and this is Dean. Now, if you find value in this episode, be sure to give us a like, subscribe, and drop a comment below on YouTube. Share us with your friends, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, and if you want to take a screenshot and tag us on Instagram, just do that by putting in at flex underscore success. And while you're on Instagram, you can check out everything we offer from our eBooks to courses and programs. You can book a consultation or inquire about coaching via the link in our bio, or you can do that on our website. Enjoy the episode. Before we introduce our guest today, those watching on YouTube will probably see that we have a rubbish video quality once again. Still. Still. On the last episode, we spoke about how we couldn't get our good camera to work. And now we were trying to use this app called, what is it, Dean? I ruin. I R U I N. I ruin. I don't know. Anyways, we quick, haven't. Quick shout out to Strong Media on Instagram, actually, for the recommendation. Yeah. That's um, true. I don't actually know his name. I don't know. I call him uh, Young Thin Santa because he looks like Young Thin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so video quality, shit again. But look, you're not here for the video quality. You're here for the information and the inappropriate jokes. Mm. And we promise to deliver. And we're blaming <laughs> Portugal for this anyway. For the because other, we would be able to use iRuin if the Wi-Fi was working. Right, and the, the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi shit has house. decided to die. So we're using our phones. Anyways, Holly, bring us some good news. Welcome to the podcast, Holly. <laughs> Very much. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. <laughs> we were on your podcast recently, um, yes, and we thought we would have you on because although you thought we had some cool stuff to share on yours, you have some cool stuff to share on ours. For those that don't know you. Could you please give us a quick intro? Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? So my name is Holly. Um, I am an online physique coach as well as the head of exercise mechanics for the Physique Collective, which is a member site with kind of experts in all kinds of realms, such as, you know, training and nutrition and lots of different things like like optimal physique development, really. Um, And then as well as that, I do have a full time job. So I work in clinical trials. So I have a degree in genetics um, and I've gone through research from the lab to the clinic to the hospital, now to industry. So I've been through it all. Um, and I suppose the reason why I do all of this is just that I love to help people and in various ways, I, whether it's through research or whether it's through, you know, helping people feel better about themselves uh, within their own bodies and, and in day to day life. And um, I'm always trying to basically just just help people where I can and, and help people to achieve the goals that they want and kind of lead them lead them to where they want to be mm, mm. cool when you say optimal physique development you're talking about competitive athletes but you're also talking about non-competitive athletes who have really competitive or extreme goals right you're not talking about like everyday individuals that just want to get a bit leaner yeah so the, the website is geared more towards people who have been training and they've been you know following a certain you know dietary structure for a while and they just want to kind of take things to the next level and and see what they can achieve by kind of elevating themselves in many different ways um from my perspective though as a as a coach I do coach a lot of physique athletes but I do like to coach people of all abilities like right from the very beginning all the way up to top level competitor um I quite enjoy the variety I quite like helping a variety of different people it's nice to um not forget what it feels like to be there at the beginning and to know you know how when you start off when you don't know anything how to lead someone into kind of developing that awareness of nutrition and training and and how to navigate life and things like that because I think if you do steer away from that and you gear more towards physique development um you kind of lose sight of it so it is quite good to to have that awareness to remind yourself of what it feels like to be at the beginning Mm, I think she's taking a stab at me Liz (laughs) Because you only came <laughs> right at the tip, yeah. No, well, that was, uh, I think, um, our main point of uh, discussion today that we wanted to talk to you about is because you are a jack of all trades in the sense that you have a full time job that you obviously are required to for a certain amount of hours. You also coach people. You have your own goals. Your own goals. You have mm-hmm. clients of varying abilities, um, and trying to navigate how to have these fitness goals or physique goals or whatever they may be while still living in quote-unquote normal life full-time job full-time yeah. job etc but how do, how do people do that because yeah that must be a lot mm. because your yeah. your job um you need to be in the lab monday to friday nine to five right so so not anymore so i have i have been in the labs but at the moment i work in industry so basically my role is i'm thankfully mainly home based at the moment but i do a lot of travel so i would travel to sites all over the uk i've had hospitals 
literally from Edinburgh to Plymouth to Cornwall to Blackpool to Manchester, all over the country. Um, so I've had to be able to navigate managing that and obviously the travel that comes with it with maintaining my fitness goals whether I'm on a fat loss phase or whether I'm on an improvement season phase um I have to be able to juggle the both mm. okay whereabouts are you currently so I live in Manchester so yeah. I'm home based from here um but I, I have previously worked in Ireland I've worked in the University of Cambridge which was my lab based job I've worked on site in a hospital every day which involved going to the pharmacy going to the operating room going to the lab going to the office like literally all in one day and I've done that through preps and through peak weeks leading up to shows um so I've had had my fair experience of it because people always like in in physique development realm people refer to you know bodybuilders and gen pops but I feel like I am myself a general population because I have a nine to five job and I have to navigate everything just like my clients have to do so I don't think there's necessarily that segregation that people talk about Mm, it's way more gray yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah so for those listening who have full-time jobs that might not identify as a competitive athlete you think that you still have lots of insights for them even though you are also competing because you kind of identify as both yeah I, def I definitely do I have like practical advice and things that I've obviously tried myself but I suppose I need to be aware that the mindset is definitely not going to be the same whereas you know when there's things that I'm willing to do because I, I need to do it to attain a high level or like a very extreme goal for someone else I know they may not be willing to do that they may have other priorities um over that so I have to kind of keep that in my head as well that you know they won't necessarily do everything that it takes because they don't have to they don't need to to reach mm. the goal that they want um so it is kind of being aware of the mindset between it as well yeah mm. for sure when we look at uh clients we call it readiness mm. willingness is like one of the three categories of of readiness and so there's, there's willingness, like what are you willing to do, which you've spoken about. There's also somebody's confidence in their ability that they can change. And that's something that a good coach can help someone develop. Um, and then there's also knowing really what to do in the first place, because if we're misguided by wrong plans, like your readiness isn't, isn't quite there. Um, but maybe you can talk us through what what you think people should know or the lessons that you've learned trying to juggle like a quote-unquote normal life and having goals as well where would you start yeah so the first thing that I think people just have this mental barrier saying I can't juggle it I just can't do it I can't manage my nine-to-five while maintaining you know my fitness goals I can't travel that's impossible and they almost put that mental barrier up first before trying to find solutions and mm. um, but what I always say to people is like no matter where you are in the world you are in control of what goes in your mouth so it doesn't matter where you are you can still manage that like there's usually not going to be someone who's trying to shove any kind of food down your throat so you're able to control that wherever you are um and then it's kind of just looking more practically instead of thinking like emotionally saying, oh, this is overwhelming, I can't do it. Breaking it down into really simple, okay, what are my targets for the day? Okay, I have to eat this much calories. I have to eat this much protein. I have to get this many steps. I have to do this cardio or I have to do this session or whatever. And just finding kind of like simple and practical ways of achieving those things. Like I find, for example, when I'm traveling, I find it quite easy to get my steps in while I've even trying, um, especially if I'm, you know, getting a train and I decide to walk from the station to where I'm staying or um, walking to the site visit that I'm going to instead of getting a taxi. Just those little things all add up for me to achieve my step goal in terms of if you need to get cardio in or if you need to train. There's literally always a 24 hour gym, usually somewhere around you, unless you're literally in the back of nowhere. Um, if you're in a city, if you're in a town, there's going to be somewhere where you can get that done if you need to. Um, if not, like I often say that for most of my clients and for myself, I don't actually have like programmed rest days into my week just because I like to use them as buffers if I need them. So if I am going to a site where there's like no gym around or I know I'll be pressed for time, I will schedule that rest day in that day um, just so I'm not stressing about it. And I just know, okay, this is my rest day. That's absolutely fine. Like I find that really helps make my life less stressful than mm. having scheduled rest days on exact days. Um, and for the same reason, I don't like having like different amounts of calories on training days and on training days. I like to keep it all the same just because if I'm eating training day food and realize I can't train, then I'm like, oh crap, like <laughs> what am I going to do? Because I've already eaten all my, all my food. Um, so things like that, just making your life 
a lot easier. Um, in terms of nutrition, like there's always going to be like a Tesco Express or like some sort of like shop nearby. And most of the time, most of these convenient shops will sell a lot of protein options now. Like they often sell, you know, cooked chicken, Greek yogurt, um, jerky, um, protein bars, protein shakes ready to drink. Like they, they have all these things now, like most petrol stations do as well at this point. Um, another thing you, we have, I don't know if you guys have it, but we have like delivery, which is um, like a food delivery service, but they now deliver groceries, uh, which is very handy if you're staying in a hotel or some accommodation and you need something like that. Um, and also like if you can, and if you're staying over wherever you stay, like I'm lucky now in my current job that I can book my own accommodation. But before that, I had to get the work travel agent to do it for me. Um, but I try and book apartments or places with kitchens or kitchenettes or at least like a microwave and a fridge um, just so I can make my meals. Um, so like all of this stuff is just really like practical advice, breaking things down, make things easy for yourself. Another thing I'd recommend is weekly step goals and weekly cardio goals, uh, which is something I do even now, even on weeks where I'm not traveling. Um, so instead of doing 10,000 steps a day, you have 70,000 a week. So if you go under one day and a bit over the other day, it all balances out and you don't have to stress about it. And same with cardio. If you just give yourself a total weekly minute count, then you can achieve that as and when you want. So you don't have to freak out if you miss a day. Mm. Um, so it's just overall just making life easier for yourself and breaking things down and finding simple ways to get things done because mm -hmm. if you break it down there's always a way to get there if you need to yeah for sure so what i'm hearing is that you have really uh firm or rigid goals like seventy thousand steps in a week uh or four or five training sessions in a week i, I didn't actually ask you the amount but you have flexible strategies in order to achieve it. It might be 8,000 steps one day and 12,000 the next day. And yeah. you just sort of like, it, it's helpful to break down 70,000 steps and what that means in a day, obviously, yeah. but you're just giving and taking. Yeah, so just, just giving yourself that flexibility so that you don't have to stress if one day you don't hit your steps, you don't hit your, car, hit your cardio and you don't train. You can't, like, it's all, that all or nothing mentality that we're trying to avoid. Like, if you, on a Monday, you miss all these three goals and then you think you've just fecked up the rest of the week, then that's a really poor mentality to be in for the rest of the week, thinking you've already failed. Whereas if you have an opportunity saying, okay, this week, this day, you know, I fell below on these targets, but that's okay because I have the rest of the week to catch up on them. And by the end of the week, I'll be back, you know, right on track. It's a much more positive mindset to mm -hmm. maintain. I feel. Yeah. Or if you're on track with your daily averages and on the second last day or the last day of the week you are under, it's not that the whole week's ruined. It's that instead of hitting 70,000 steps, you did 65,000. Or, you know, instead of averaging 2,000 calories a day, you average 2,100. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to get any of the results. It means you'll get 95% of them. Mm. Yeah. That's what I always explain to my clients is that it's not like 0% and 100%. There's a whole spectrum in between that, you know, okay, we need to, you know, ideally we'd like to stick to our goals to get 100% results, but there's nothing wrong with getting 90 or 95% results that, that week because you've had a really overwhelming week, you're really busy, run off your feet, because you're still progressing. So as long as you're taking that step forward, you know, does it really matter? Because we're still on the path towards where you want to be. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's the average over time concept too, right? Like yeah. you're far better off getting 90% every week for six weeks than you are to get 100% for three and 50% for three. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you end up at 75% with the 100 mentality. It's well, an all or nothing mindset that you said. Yeah, and with the all or nothing mindset, because we can't do all very often, we end up doing nothing more most of the time. Mm. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's... Uh, I have this gripe with individuals that claim that they give 110%. <laughs> I know you hate yeah. that so much. Um, <laughs> you can't. It's yeah. not possible. Um, yeah, and then like, I what, also what? get extremely cautious when I have people say that they were 100. Because, like, mm. I know how diligent I am. And I would still say, like, I'm probably, like, 95 to 98% of the way most of the time. You know, mm. in a prep, like subconsciously, without realizing it, you're never going to be 100 percent because you know inaccuracies of day to day life. Like your Fitbit or your tracker is going to be inaccurate, your heart rate is going to be inaccurate, your calories are going to be inaccurate. So you're actually never going to be 100 percent, even if you really, really try. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Understanding that I think makes it easier to also then be okay with these slight one or two or three or four percent deviations or you know shifts each day because. Like I, again, I remember in the past, I'd be like, oh, I'm at 9,950 steps. I've got to do 10,000. So I'd just walk around the room. You know? <laughs> yeah. Whereas now I'm like, oh, whatever. 
Mm. Right? The 50 steps doesn't mean shit because tomorrow I'll probably do 10,050. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. For some, something I worked on with um, when I was coached by Luke Hoffman, who I know you're good friends with, um, is if I was weighing out serving a protein and say I was doing 25 grams away and I got 26 grams, just to leave the gram there, like it's more stress taking the gram off than to just leave it there. Like in the grand scheme of things, it's going to make no difference. Whereas you see on Instagram saying, oh, you know, if you're, if you don't care enough to take that one gram off and you don't really want to know, do you? And you're like, you know, there comes a point where you have to take the pros and cons of doing something and it's just easier to sleep there and not stress yourself out, especially if you do have that mindset where you do have tend towards a poorer relationship with food. It's better to nurture that than to take the gram off. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Especially when uh, we know that, you know, whatever database we're using might say that bananas have 19 point something grams of carbs in them, but it's going to differ from banana to banana. So we can't be exact. And also we set our calories based off an estimated total daily energy expenditure and we plus yeah. and minus from there. And it is estimated. And even though, even if we are eating exactly what we think we're eating, we might be moving a little bit more or less um, than what we did the following day. So we can yeah. never be like right on and close yeah. enough is good enough. That's yeah, not to say like that we should, I'm um, sorry, you go. No, no, you're fine. I was going to say, that's not that we should have the close enough is good enough with things that really matter. Like, eh, I got three sessions instead of five this week. Like, mm. no, not really. And then uh, how long is a piece of string? Then you can give that out a bit more. Oh, I'm supposed to eat 500 grams of veg today. Eh, 300 is enough. And, you know, that, that attitude can sink in. But when it is like one gram of protein or 50 steps, like on the grand scheme of things, trying to be perfect like that is just going to lead to burnout. Mm. Yeah, especially when people, a lot of people who are into fitness and into training anyway, have that kind of personality where they want to be perfect and they want to strive for more. So it's kind of nice to give yourself that leeway when you can, because I think for the most part, for a lot of people who are into fitness, I know it's obviously going to be different for beginners or people who are embarking on fat loss phases, but um, they generally do tend to be on the side of obsessive and trying to be everything perfect so it's nice to kind of take a step back and and kind of worry on worry more about what really really matters like your big rocks rather than the sand um just kind of taking care of the, the main things that are going to matter and as you said like you cannot estimate or exactly track how many calories you burn in a day like as what I was going to say was that you know as you diet we know that we have our non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is basically all the calories that we burn when we are not exercising, but it's not our basal metabolic rate, just the daily things we do day to day. But we also have something called NENAT, which is non-exercise, non-activity thermogenesis, which is literally like your facial tone. Like as you diet, you'll start to smile a bit less. Your face will move a bit less because you're trying to conserve energy. You'll stop like fidgeting as much, twitching as much. And all this stuff like is completely involuntary. You don't even notice it but that's going to slow down the amount of calories that you burn but you're not going to necessarily account for that like you're not going to know oh that exactly it burnt. doesn't pick that up <laughs> no no you're not going to say okay well today I burned 30 less calories from you know smiling so I'm going to eat 30 less calories like it just doesn't work that way like that it has to be just an estimation and, and we hope that we get close but we're never going to be fully there yeah hmm. so we've just told everybody that's listening that we're just guessing <laughs> Yeah, it's an estimated guess, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's an educated guess. <laughs> yeah. It's a guesstimation. Yeah, guesstimation. <laughs> exactly. So, are the um, targets that you have for yourself different in your off season to your comp prep stage? Yeah, definitely. And there's probably a lot more flexibility in an off season because, as we know, a prep is a very extreme goal. You're getting to very low levels of body fat and it's not something to embark on unless you are stepping on stage like I would never try and get a client to achieve that level of conditioning unless they're ready for stage so bear that in mind as a caveat that this is not going to be for everyone um in a prep situation where everything has to be nailed one way or another um but in off season I'm definitely more flexible like I'll probably have a lot less cardio to do um step targets I'll probably have one but you know it's not the end of the world if I miss the odd day you know I don't necessarily feel like I have to catch up if I don't want to, if I'm too busy, if there's a lot going on, um, my training will stay the same. Obviously, that's really important. Um, and then in terms of nutrition, definitely more flexibility there. Like you don't have to track every gram uh, to a T. You don't have to be so specific and so rigid um, and you can have more flexibility. So I would I would take more opportunity. Like when you're traveling, like it's nice to be able to experience 
different places and different foods and things like that so when I am not dieting I definitely take advantage of that because I love food like I am someone who, I've come from a food family my parents are in the food business it's something we talk about all day long like I don't want to um sacrifice and deprive myself for the sake of it when I don't need to when I don't have that extreme goal um so I definitely enjoy myself but I do definitely have that awareness of you know my hunger and satiety signals I like years ago used to be one of those people that told myself that I had to finish my plate I had to always lick my plate and I just could never leave anything behind but since like doing a lot of reading and kind of researching into you know mindfulness and you know intuitive eating and also as we talked about on your podcast on my podcast the informed eating process um I definitely have more of an awareness of at what stage of the hunger scale I am when I want to eat when I want to stop eating when it's okay to leave things behind um and just reminding yourself that you know food will always be there like you don't have to finish it because you'll never have that again because you definitely can um so it's not that scarcity mindset as well um so yeah I definitely approach things very different in the off season in terms of just flexibility loosening the reins a bit because you know competitors are not robots like we get fatigue from all the thinking and the decisions to make about being so rigid every single day that we need that time off like it, it does get exhausting like Dean will know like and you I'm sure you will know as well that like when you when you've been so rigid for so long you need to take a step back no matter how on Instagram you say you're so hardcore and you know everything has to be 110 percent um you will at one point need to take a, a step back from it because it does it's very very tiring mm. oh. and one thing that Dean and I uh have integrated into our life to make that less tiring is just like a enjoyable routine. We roll out of bed and go for like a 30 minute walk in the morning. And we don't think about it as cardio or exercise or steps. It's like, it's just nice to get outside and like see the cliffs in Portugal. Mm. We like the sunshine, we like the breeze, like it's just beautiful. Um, and we both eat at 10 o'clock. We have egg whites and a whole bunch of veg. I spoil myself with putting a full egg in there, by the way. I have one. Oof, egg. wild. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, Dean doesn't. Because I'm hardcore and I do things at 110%. <laughs> he saved his fats for later. But <laughs> but we enjoy that meal. We don't really have to think about it because, we you know, it's 10 o'clock. This is what we eat at 10 o'clock. You know, we might get sick of it in a month and change it for something else. You know, we'll keep it protein and veg. But that way we are keeping calories under control. We're getting enough veg and fiber in in the day. Our steps are in and it's just part of our routine. I... I haven't competed in the longest time. I don't plan on doing it in the future, but I don't think of myself as dieting or on a diet or trying to lose weight. I'm just maintaining a healthy diet and healthy lifestyle, which means, you know, stress management, sleep, st movement, like mm. steps, for example. Um, and Dean and I are in a similar boat to you. We don't travel for work, but we travel while we work. Like when mm. we were in England for four months, we weren't in one place for any longer than two weeks at a time or three weeks right. actually in Liverpool. Um, but we moved constantly, but we still got out of bed and went for a morning walk. We still ate a protein and veg meal at 10 o'clock. We, you know, we ate out, but we were always mindful of what we were selecting on the menu. It doesn't mean that, well, <laughs> Dean didn't eat out because yeah, he was say, prepping. I did. Prep. Um, but that doesn't mean that, oh God, I can't eat out anywhere. It's like, no, I won't choose a pizza joint. I will choose something that has sensible options. If I'm eating out with a friend, maybe I'll share an entree and share a dessert, but we're just being mindful and we're just working enjoyable things into our life. Yeah, I think the, um, the key is having some rigidity to your framework, mm -hmm. but then flexibility to your implementation. Okay. You know, like the framework is we have certain health-seeking behaviours, e.g. protein veg for nutrition, movement in the morning, training five times per week if we can but four times is enough yeah but the flexibility shifts like you kind of said before holly's like oh this day just got real busy well I'm today's gonna, a public holiday train. in portugal so the gyms are closed yeah and <laughs> yeah. you know there's a lot of content to get done today so like today's yeah. a no train day for me but by the end of my sort of seven day lapse or period i'll probably get four sessions in this week so we can tick that off mm. um which actually wouldn't mind teasing out of it you said before that you don't uh write in rest days specifically what does that look like in like uh, like theory and application for you so that an individual can kind of, yeah, I suppose, take something from that from a, a training perspective? So I suppose there's two reasons. Like a lot of it obviously is my travel and my work, but it's also like my own recovery and kind of auto-regulation in terms of how I'm feeling that day. Like if 
if I were to have a set schedule where I rest on these specific days, what if, you know, there is one day where I just feel absolutely battered, but my program tells me I have to train, so therefore I have to train. Like, what if I've had a terrible night's sleep? What if I'm really, really stressed? What if I have my full-time day of jobs and then I have, you know, a podcast recording or a few consults to do and then, you know, developing more stuff for the Physique Collective site? Like, I have many hats I have to wear every single day um and if I'm absolutely swamped but my training plan says I have to train then it's just not going to be optimal in terms of like my well-being my performance my strength levels I'm not going to enjoy the session as much I'm going to be overwhelmed I'm going to just want to take the box and get it done I'm not going to put as much intent into my sessions if I don't feel ready for it so to me it's always made sense to kind of ultra regulate my rest days and I suppose the more I've learned about training and, and the more advanced I become as a bodybuilder or an athlete or whatever you want to call me um the more awareness I have of my own recovery capabilities my own you know feelings my own biofeedback obviously at the beginning that's something that might take time to develop um but with time you start to notice these things and you start to kind of assess yourself based on your motivation to train you know your readiness to train have you progressed in your previous sessions are you feeling any soreness from your previous sessions all these kind of things you, you tick boxes and ask yourself kind of in your head um so yeah it just makes sense to me to, to mm. auto regulate my own also when i'm traveling sometimes it's just absolutely impossible if i'm down in cornwall and i can't find the gym like it's probably better off me to take a rest day than to just like traipse around the whole county trying to find somewhere yeah so i have two follow-up questions there so does it look like you just essentially essentially have like session one through five and then you just train them sequentially as per these feedback mechanisms no so so yeah no i have sessions one through five which i will usually do in the same order every week just because i prefer it you know doing that order um and i will try and have a rough idea when i want to separate them like i've done um three sessions monday tuesday wednesday if i'm not really doing anything that week I'll rest today on a Thursday and then train Thursday Friday or Friday Saturday and then take Sunday off so I try and kind of intersperse them so there is a bit of a gap but sometimes I literally will have to run Monday to Friday because I'm so busy at the weekend or I have to take Monday Tuesday off and run the rest of the week and obviously that's not quote unquote optimal um because you likely will need a rest in between but sometimes I have to get it done because as I said I do have an extreme goal at the moment so it just has to get done um so that kind of thing I have to have to give and take on um, but usually I try and intersperse them kind of midweek and end of week I love having Sundays off I, I don't really like training on a Sunday because I feel like that's just the day to like relax and reset and prepare yourself for Monday ahead mm. um so yeah okay and then my my, my second question because <clears throat> this is one that I've uh, spoken to clients recently about who are actually about to travel as well which and and doing this myself is Okay, we could argue that training to a specific program in the same gym, in the same order, with the same rep ranges is the most optimal for measuring progress over time, right? Because we're minimizing the amount of noise or variables. But how do you go about managing performance if you are training in different gyms with potentially different equipment, you know, or potentially different exercise order because they're busy at 6 p.m. when it's the only time you train. How are you managing, like, I suppose, uh, referencing progression and that when you do have to shift from your norm? Obviously, it's going to be difficult because you're never going to be able to exactly match a stimulus that you get in one gym, one set of equipment versus another. So although we can look at volume as an indicator, it's never going to be 100% correct um especially when you use different machines like we use a shoulder press from one brand versus a shoulder press from another brand the volume on them isn't going to be the same because one of them is going to better match your own profile and one of them's not so therefore the volume is going to be different so it's i think it's an oversimplification just to count volume in terms of weight times sets or weight times sets times reps or whatever you want to use um because there's so much more that goes into it but as an indication i feel that when you become into training and when you get into training, you definitely should learn the skill of like assessing your proximity to failure. So how close you are to that last rep where you literally can't, you can't do the rep. Um, because having that skill and that ability will allow you to kind of auto-regulate and standardize your exercises regardless of where you are. So if you're training to a reps and reserve scheme and you have maybe two reps and reserves to do that week, kind of being aware of okay no matter what 
machine I'm on, no matter what cable stock I'm on, I know when, okay, I have two, two reps left now, I'm going to stop. Um, and that's going to be a, a very good way of maintaining some sort of standardization. Obviously, it's it's going to be difficult because it's never going to be 100% standardized because session to session isn't even 100% standardized because the way you complete a rep is different. Uh, your own fatigue is different. Your glycogen stores are different. Your creatine levels are different. There's going to be so many different things. Um, but overall, maintaining some sort of proximity to failure and then just picking similar movement patterns, ideally sim similar machines if you can, um, and just just doing your best like it, it like it is going to be it's not going to be necessarily 100% optimal but you just have to kind of take that on board and, and do your best don't go into a new gym and just do whatever you feel like still go in with a plan and a strategy and um, but maybe be open to swapping out an exercise for something else if you have to if the gym is busy if you're in a rush um, and just being flexible in that respect yeah mm. I mean um, because we move around so much we're always training at different gyms so I found it handy to pretty much to stick to dumbbells and barbells because a 20 kilo dumbbell is the same in Portugal as it is in Croatia, where we'll be in 10 days. Um, but I definitely hear you that from one brand to another is so different. Like a leg press, for example, a sled for a leg press might weigh, I don't know, 50 kilos for this brand and 30 kilos for another brand. So even if I'm adding, I don't know, 200 kilo, 100 kilos either side of the leg press, plus the 50 kilogram sled in this gym, but plus only the 30 kilogram sled mm. in that gym. One with um, rust, one without rust. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one where the range of motion is better for me and one where it's not so good. Um, yeah, but it's also it's like the angle of a leg press. Like if, you, if it's a 45 degree leg press, right. you're only lifting 30% of the load. Whereas if it's a higher, you could be lifting 50% of the load. So there are so many different things. And then the cam systems are really, really intricate. Um, all of the different things that go on inside machines, it's very, very complicated. So it's going to be impossible to get it exact. And um, even myself, as someone who's been into exercise mechanics for the past three or four years now, I still get confused by it. Um, so yeah, you just have to find one way that you think will work to as much as possible and just go with it and don't overthink or second guess things because you're there, you can't do anything about it. Just make the most of where you are and just get it done. Mm. So if we, if we were to chuck a, uh, a clean wrap up on that, it would be, you want to try and match perhaps the, movement the amount of the movement pattern and the amount of effective reps those being re a reference for like oh, any any reps achieved failure. one to three from failure like you mentioned yeah uh, and then, then that would obviously be dictated by sets potentially too and then call it a day yeah movement patterns and then you know your your volume roughly what you're meant to achieve and then just maybe just focusing because obviously the movement patterns are not going to be exact so maybe just spend more time focusing on prescribed tempo and contraction and really just squeezing the muscles and, and really placing intent on the muscles you're trying to train and really get that stimulus where you can because it is going to be a novel setup for you so you, we all know that when we uh, start a new program it takes a couple of weeks to kind of adapt to it and get used to it um, but we only have this one session to get it done um, so maybe just placing more focus on the stimulus on internal focus on intent on contraction all that kind of stuff and it, it's probably good practice to be fair because I feel like even more advanced trainees kind of neglect all of those sensations and those feelings they should be trying to achieve instead of just completing a rep and, and lifting it from A to B. Mm. For sure and it's also good practice to understand the difference between actual mechanical failure and just stopping because something really hurts. Yeah, um, And I do think that even though we're kind of laughing at it, it's something that people get confused at all the time. They're like, oh yeah, no, I stopped because I think I probably only had two reps left. It's like, well, no, it just started hurting. Like you yeah. can see like the speed of the bar didn't really change. Mm. Like there's, yeah. So how do you explain to your clients the difference between pain and uh, actual mechanical failure? Well, first of all, we have to distinguish between, you know, is it, pain or is it like muscular fatigue oh that's because if something's yeah. hurting um that's different so you kind of have to assess when they say ow that hurts you need to say okay is that just your muscular fatigue building up is that just kind of lactic acid production things like that so we first need to distinguish kind of the terminology there um and then like there are different things we look for when a, a set is coming to the end um so is is the rep, as you said, slowing down? So is your contraction velocity slowing down um, to the point where a rep that you feel is going the same amount of speed is actually slowing down 
involuntarily without you trying. Now I have seen clients, you know, nearly purposely try and slow down a rep so they can stop. Um, but we try, yeah, we try and that where possible. <laughs> um, and then things like, is their body positioning changing? Like, are they kind of um, using more compensatory mechanisms to help get that rep from A to B instead of just keeping a, a stable position? Um, are they losing control? Like at their start and stop point, are they losing that ability to fully control those two points? Um, are they using a bit of what we call inertia or momentum to get that weight up instead of just controlling the entire range of that rep? So there's another number of different things we look for. Um, so yeah, and it depends on the client um, what failure is. Um, so some of them we want to say, okay, literally we'll get to the very end when we fully exhausted the muscle and that's maybe more for a more trained athlete. Um, but for someone at the beginning, we don't need to go there really. Um, so maybe when the rep slows down a bit, um, when they maybe start to shift their body a little bit, we might call the set there um, because the risk to reward ratio is in the favor of stopping a bit earlier. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I had a, a client tell me the other day, he watches his client's training videos uh, on mute so that he's not um, <laughs> misguided by sound. Because you yeah. know, some people are the same. They either, they do, they either do the face grimace or they do the noise grimace. Mm. So he just watches them on quiet. I'm I like, do think that making noise can be habitual because I've seen guys pick up weights and start doing like, I don't know, dumb shit oh, could you imagine with dumbbells. <laughs> and it's like they start grunting. I'm like, that doesn't hurt. Like yeah. you're yeah. just, you just began your warm up. So yeah, that's a good point. It can't like, but there's a difference between it uh, to it. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like the uh, is just sometimes, like you said, it's a habitual, like when I press, I go. Well, I must say, not that I'm a huge fan of gender norms or whatsoever. I think they're very harmful. My grunts on the um, like squat machine mm. are quite masculine. I noticed the other day, I forgot <laughs> the earphones. So I had to train with my own thoughts and whatever background music was on. And I could hear my grunting for the first time and it was deep. Mm. That is one of the disadvantages <laughs> of having earphones is you can make some noise that you're not aware of. Oh, yeah, exactly. I didn't really care about my noises. I was just surprised. I was like, that's, <laughs> that is a low-toned masculine grunt, Liz. Mm. Yeah. I'm all right with it, though. I accept who I am. <laughs> I don't have I to have high-toned <laughs> grunts to be a female. <laughs> I'd be a little bit worried if you were like, he. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a bit weirder. <laughs> I would rather you grunt to say like a man yeah. than to be the one that's like, <laughs> like doing like, as if you're like the high breath. Labor. Right. We'll see. Dean, I challenge you the next time you do, I don't know, whatever your session is next mm -hmm. on your first working set, I challenge you to make feminine grunting noises. I don't know what that would sound like. <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't know if I want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I may record it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah something like that. Or sexual. No, I don't care. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, um, <laughs> Dean gives more fucks than I do. Like, I will walk outside in a costume and be like, how you do it? Like, I have no sense of shame whatsoever. So I feel like this is something that I would find funny. But Dean, because he gives probably normal amount of fucks. I feel like that yeah, would be say, embarrassing for you. It's not like I'm sensitive. No, you're not sensitive. You're just like, I just wasn't born with the sense of shame or embarrassment. I just, <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so what? So so far, I like so the 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 message I think I'm getting the most here for people that have like full time jobs or otherwise like large outside commitments is to try and figure out what the minimum effective dose is to use that terminology in all things, and then like what is maybe like the maximum, the optimal, and then how do we find flexibility between them? Mm. Yeah, like finding yeah. like your your non negotiables, and they mm. could be non negotiables. But the way to achieve them can be a bit more flexible and doesn't have to be so rigid. Yeah. So non-negotiable for training might be four sessions. It might be... 70,000 steps a week. 70,000 steps a week. Those four sessions may also be non-negotiable and they might be like, you know, two uppers, two lowers, this amount of effective reps. Mm. And then how you achieve yeah. that is... Yeah. And then nutrition, is that sort of something that's a sliding scale for you too? Like some people are uh, protein plus calories. Some people are more like protein, carbs, fats within ranges is that something that you kind of go for yeah so obviously as I said it depends on the phase I'm in whether I'm in a muscle building phase or a fat loss phase but in off season and like when I'm trying to build muscle I literally never count my carbs and fats I just think like I, I know that probably people are like hardcore bodybuilders are going to say to me you know you should be tracking everything to the gram and you should be following a strict meal plan you should be clean eating all this stuff but 
I just don't want it. Like I am not a professional athlete and I don't do this for a living. Like I have a full-time job. I have a life outside of bodybuilding. I just want to enjoy my day-to-day life. And I, if I had to be miserable following an exact meal plan every single day to a T with macros, I just, I would just wouldn't enjoy it. Um, so for me in off season, I, calories and protein are absolutely fine for me. Even with protein, it's a range. It's not going to be an exact number. Calories are probably going to be a bit of a range as well. Um, because just that amount of rigidity in when you're trying to build muscles just not necessary um whereas when you're in a fat loss phase especially when you get closer to something like a show where you need to really manipulate things like your electrolyte balance and your your fat amounts and all these kind of things you probably do need to be more specific now you know joe has provided me with a meal plan which i don't really follow but i've kind of made my own one um which is i is kind of like a template i call it um I can change little bits of it during the day, day to day. So the foundations are there. So I'm never stuck thinking, oh my God, what am I going to have for this meal? Because I know roughly what I'm going to have. But if I want to tweak it, if I want to have, you know, chicken instead of lean beef mince, or if I want to have rice instead of potato one day or something like that, as long as I equate it calorie wise, mm. I, I will do that. I don't have an issue with that. Yeah. Mm. So you mentioned that, you know, you don't count your, just, just actually, we'll maybe take a step back for people that aren't too familiar with macro tracking. So the three things that make up calories are protein, carbs, and fats. So you said, you know, you don't necessarily count your carbs and fats in your off season or your muscle building phase, but that doesn't mean you don't keep calories under control. What you're saying is you eat a minimum amount of protein and you distribute Mm -hmm. your remaining calories between carbs and fats as you please, because that gives you the flexibility that you need to adhere to the most important principles long-term. Exactly. Yeah. When you think of like your main pillars that you need to achieve a muscle gain goal, obviously your protein is going to be very important. Your calories are going to be very important. Obviously, carbs are going to be important for your performance. But when you're in a surplus anyway, you're likely going to be consuming enough carbohydrates. Um, mm. And same with fats. If you're you know conscious about including healthy fats in your diet, you shouldn't really be able to struggle with getting that in either. Um, mm. So that's just personal preference. Like some people are different. Some people want to hit everything on the nail on the head every single day, but that's not how I like to live. Yeah. Yeah. I think one, well, I think they even had the biggest takeaway from there is that you ask yourself the question of like, is this approach, what approach is optimal? What approach is like adequate? And then what are the pros and cons of each one? What's optimal for me? Yeah. And mm. then which is optimal for me? That's mm. the last bit is, most yeah. people forget to ask themselves, like, will I actually enjoy doing this? You know, can I do it for long enough? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like, but yeah. I always say that with like training plans, like if you create the most optimal training plan in the world on paper, if someone just looks at it and goes, meh, don't like it, it's just not optimal for them. So you have to take into account like the enjoyment of the client and the pre- personal preference of the client because that's what's going to be underpinning their adherence and their long term success. Yeah. Yeah. yeah two know. of my guys coming out of comp got deadlifts. And they're like, I haven't deadlifted in 12 months. I'm like, well, because there was no need to. They're like, but I wanted to. And I was like, that's why you're getting it. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. For no yeah. other reason. Because you want to. Yeah. 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 yeah it's definitely really important. Now, and just getting um, that like trust from the client as well. Sorry. Um, by including things they like. Like, I know, like, it could be really easy to go onto Chronometer, which is like a website which shows you all your micronutrients and making sure they're 100%. Um, but I will always ask in a consultation form, what foods do you love and what foods do you not like? Because I'm not going to give you a meal plan, even though if if on this app it says that, you know, it's completely nutritionally perfect and complete. You know, I want you to enjoy your life and enjoy your food. Mm. Yeah, I uh, shan't be writing in like liver pate and oysters <laughs> without <laughs> questioning a person would enjoy that. <laughs> no. As a coach, asking those questions and actually actioning actioning it, wow, uh, on a plan of some sort, either within a framework or a meal plan, if you want to be that specific, also makes the client feel like they're important to you and it makes Mm -hmm. them feel heard. Uh, And I think those things help a client be adherent to a plan. And we know adherence is necessary to reach the goal. It also removes that idea of uh, the diet. I'm on a diet. Yeah. But rather I'm following a nutrition guideline uh, because usually that is it. People go to X coach, they say, I want X result. They say, here's the diet. They follow the diet, they get the result. And then they go, well, fuck now what, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's the diet for that result at that time. But, but it, it still amazes me that, yeah, we, I have clients even now that are surprised when I say, hey, like what exercises would you like this week or in this program and what you absolutely not want to do, mm. <laughs> you know? 
well, I'd rather just do what I need to do. Because like, eh. you're not going to give your everything to something you don't really like, yeah. nutrition or training. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. Well, <laughs> I feel like there's a, there's a lot of practical stuff there for people. But if we were to ask you, because the podcast is about how to be less shit, for a less shit tip, maybe like a take-home point, how can people be less shit uh, when trying to juggle their full-time job, full-time life and fitness goals? I would say the main thing that I would find both for myself and my clients is just to not think so emotionally when it comes to achieving something like this, because it's going to seem overwhelming at first and you're going to wonder how can I juggle all these things. But if you just sat yourself down with a piece of paper and literally put down all the things you had to get done in a day and gave yourself a solution on how to do it, usually you'll be like, oh, that actually wasn't so bad. I actually managed that okay. Um, so I would say, yeah, stop, don't think so. Don't get so overwhelmed by the thought because it usually is quite manageable. Um, also be, as we said, quite flexible with how you achieve these goals um, because your body doesn't reset at midnight every single day. Like it is kind of a transient process, the whole fat loss, muscle gain thing. Um, so it's rolling weeks and weeks. Um, so one day is not going to be the be all and end all of your progress. But I would also say that, you know, it's okay to ask for help in these situations. Like, don't let your pride get in the way because, oh, I should be able to do this. Um, you know, I should know by now how to achieve these things because even I sometimes need, you know, need to ask questions for my coach and um, everyone needs a helping hand sometimes. So, like, don't be afraid to ask for help. There's usually people on Instagram, like, that you look up to who are perfectly happy to give their advice and answer questions and stuff like that. And I find that from, like, having my own podcast that, like, all these people who I look up to are always more than happy to help me out and give me advice and to give me their time and stuff like that. So don't feel alone if you do struggle with things like this, because there's always help if you look for it. Mm, I think it makes you human too. Yeah. Yeah. And the fastest way to stop progressing is to think that you know everything too. Mm. Yeah. Don't do that. Mm. Yeah. I I like the, uh, the mentor slash coach approach to this, because like you said, I think right back in the beginning is that there's a lot of emotional fatigue and psychological fatigue associated with trying to think about all of the things you need to do, let alone then deciding what else do I need to change in order to still facilitate this result. Mm. When you can kind of push that off to somebody and just say, Hey, can you tell me what I need to do for a bit? Give me these guidelines. You, you can, just follow. You can divorce from that emotional attachment, you know, like, and the Joe's, decision yeah, making. Yeah, if Joe said to you, hey, like as so long as you're within 10 grams, I don't really care. Then you'd be like, yeah. oh, thank fuck, like that's okay. Whereas yeah. if you're doing it yourself, you might be like, oh, I'm five grams out. I'm I'm you know, I'm cheating myself. And yeah. 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 And the thing is, even if you know that yourself, like if you are a coach yourself, sometimes it's nice to have that objective perspective telling you because you know we all mess around with our own heads we all tell ourselves things and we're all a bit hard on ourselves so it's nice to have that you know voice of reason outside that will kind of direct you Mm, 100% absolutely Um, now we like to ask our guests if they have something worth sharing because we think our guests are interesting people with interesting hobbies and you can share something within the fitness industry or it could be something totally unrelated what do you think you want to share with the audience? Ooh, there's a lot of there's a lot of things I want to share. So I basically my goal, especially on like social media, is to just provide as much helpful content as I can. So I basically use my clients as my creativity. So any problem they have, I will likely you know make a video about it, or I'll seek answers for it, or I will find some way to kind of give the answer. So I do that in like a number of ways as like. They, um, Dean and Lizzie have said, I do have my own podcast um, where I get on lots of different guests. We've had Dean and Lizzie on themselves where we talked about informed eating. Um, I've had Lauren Conlon on who's talked about kind of moving away from rigid dieting and, and back into kind of normal life, quote unquote, and how to diet as a non-competitor. Um, so basically my aim is to just put out stuff that's going to be helpful for people. Um, so if you do check out my Instagram, I'm just at Holly Davidge or my podcast, which is Elevate HD. Um, I'm also on the Physique Collective website. I actually have a full video on how to um, adhere to your diet and your fitness plans while traveling. Um, so I've kind of tried to cover everything I can and just, and just give what I can to people to help them where possible. Cool. Love it. Sounds good. 
Also, yeah. I do have a quote that is, that is unrelated, but it is one of my favorite quotes. Um, my favorite quote is, a true master is an eternal student, which is one I like to live by because I just feel, as you said before, like when you feel like you know everything, that's a dangerous situation to be in. Um, and you should always, always be pursuing more knowledge, more learning, more experience, because there's always more to learn. And the more you learn, the more you realize, the more there is to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of like a never ending uh, journey, but I find that really exciting because I think years ago, I used to think, oh my God, I'm never gonna know everything. This is like, what's the point? But now I find it exciting that there's always more ways to get better and improve yourself. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I think that quote was Einstein's. Was <laughs> it's my favorite quote. <laughs> no, I was I was reading this book recently called Everything Is Fucked. Excellent book. While we're sharing well, cool re things, re rereading, right? Well, yeah, reading for the second time. Um, and he mentioned that Einstein is the most misquoted person in history, which is why Dean said it's an Einstein quote. It's not. Oh, really? Everyone <laughs> says, yeah. Einstein said. <laughs> Einstein didn't say any of those things. If the shoe fits. <laughs> Remember when he said that back in whatever years he was alive? <laughs> to avoid hangovers, maybe don't drink like a dickhead, <laughs> Einstein said. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Mm. Holly. That's a good quote. I like that quote. Yeah. I've actually heard that quote before, and it wasn't until I spent some time doing jujitsu that I really understood what it meant. Because you start on your white belt, and as a white belt, you know, sweet fuck all. And I look at the black belts and they move around on the mats like they were born there. They're incredible. Um, and I was surprised to see that the black belts came to just as many classes as the white belts, probably more actually. They were more consistent. They hung around after class and showed each other like, how did you do that choke? And, and this, I was like, how do they not know everything yet? They're black belts. Mm -hmm. But they're black belts and they're masters because they continue to learn and they know how much more there is to know. And even the things they do know, they can do better. Mm. Um, so and that's I like why them. they're called the teacher's professors, I think, right? That's well, yeah, in jujitsu, they're called professors. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's which makes kind of sense. Well, at first I was like, yeah. you're a PhD, what do you mean? Yeah. But, <laughs> but they are just masters at what they do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now we want to introduce a new topic, a new topic, a new segment on this episode. We're calling it Hot Topics. Yeah. <laughs> because we wrap up with some segments, right? There's the be less shit, there's something worth sharing. Now we've got Hot Topics. We're breaking the ice with you, Holly. We are breaking Ooh. the ice with you. Um, <laughs> I've always cute. wanted some sort of keyboard where I have noises, where I can like boo people and do like a crowd applause. That she can't be trusted. No, I'm not allowed to have one apparently because I would have been <laughs> Dean every time he tried to talk. Um, but for hot topics, I really want to get a sound going for it. Can I can I sing it to Holly? No, it's a terrible <laughs> song. You know that hot potato, hot potato. I, you know, <laughs> I want to put hot topics instead of hot potato. The problem here is potato is a three syllable word. Potato topics is a or topic is a two syllable word. My solution maybe, because there is a solution to every no, problem. No, continue. Sorry. Do you, sorry. Do you want to sing it? No, no. I was going to say maybe we could find another language where it says topic. Oh. Like Topico. Topico, maybe. <laughs> but my solution was this. Hot to topic, hot to topic. You just do the T twice. To topic, to topic, to topic. It works because it's <laughs> tater tots. You're on to something. Do you like the song? I like it. It's very good. Okay. You're, you're allowed to say no, Holly. That's, you're not. You're not. That is the official new intro to the Hot Topic segment. Hot to topic. And the Hot Topic, what we wanted to ask you about today, and I know we're putting you on the spot here, um, <laughs> this is more of an opinion piece, so there's no right or wrong answer. We're just interested to know. Mm. When it comes to fitness goals, there's always some sacrifices that need to be made. There's a price to pay. Um, often, well, we would hope, the benefits outweigh the costs, right? We live longer, we live healthier, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but changing habits is hard. When you are pursuing extreme goals, like you two are competitive bodybuilders, the sacrifices are pretty large. You know, like social life, maybe some mental health, some relationships with your body, with food, something like that. What do you think is too much of a sacrifice? Where do you draw the line? Oh, that is a really good question. I suppose it's like, it's hard because it is, it's not a black and white thing. There is a bit of a gray area. So in terms of, as you said, say your, your physical health, there's not just good health and bad health there's a bit of a leeway in between so I suppose it's like how much am I willing to potentially risk my health 
to a point where it's no longer uh, beneficial or rewarding to me. Um, and then in terms of socializing, like, as I said, I am willing in my social life to sacrifice a lot in my prep seasons um, when I'm dieting specifically for stage but in off season I'm just not willing to do that so I will not say no to social occasions to restaurants to events to parties to drinks ever because I'm still I'm still young I have a lot of life to live and I don't want to feel like I've wasted my 20s on you know staying inside I'm just you know eating my meals um so things like that and that's why I've tried to live a relatively normal quote-unquote life compared to what a regular you know bodybuilder would look like and that's why I like to maintain my job at the moment because it keeps me kind of grounded towards what reality is compared to this bubble of bodybuilding which is not reality um so it's just allowing myself where probably in in certain situations I, I might need to go nearly all in with my goals of bodybuilding and that's kind of my priority but I do have a long period of time like I haven't competed for three years since the last time um and I've given myself the ability to go away to see my family see my friends go out do all this kind of stuff because that is really really important to me um and I'm not willing to sacrifice that mm. um but yeah and in terms in terms of my like mental health my relationship with food and my body I feel that before I started training and competing it was a lot worse um, I remember I used to go to um, shops with my mum when I was, you know, 12. I'd go into changing rooms and I would bawl my eyes out because I, I hated how I looked. Um, I was made fun of because I was overweight. Um, I used to go to restaurants and, and cry at the menu because I didn't know what, what to have. So I had all of this, all of these guessing things going on in my head where I didn't know what was the right decision. I didn't know what healthy was. I thought if I stopped eating salt I'd lose weight because I thought salt was bad for you I thought right. I thought diet coke was worse for you than regular coke like I thought all these things and I just felt I was in this vicious cycle of feeling really really unhappy in my appearance but not knowing how to fix it or how to resolve it um, and I went through Weight Watchers I went through Slimming World I went through all the clubs like when I was like 15 I was really really young and I was just so unaware of the principles of nutrition and exercise and well-being but now I feel like I'm I'm much better off because I have that awareness and that knowledge and it empowers me and equips me with the tools I need to manipulate my body composition if I want to you know be able to eat out without crying be able to go into the shop and think I, I like how I look in these clothes like that's given me a lot of freedom in a way so mm. that competing has completely like suppressed me or held me back it has given me a lot of liberation from these thoughts mm. Mm. so you don't really feel like you've sacrificed all that much of anything you've, you've gained quite a lot I've, I've gained a lot because I was one of these yeah. people growing up where I didn't have a lot of friends I didn't really fit into a, a, a group or a clique um, because I was really really academic really studious I wasn't very sporty um, so to find like a sport or an activity that I you know I was okay at that I progressed in that I found like-minded people in that accepted me I found that community, especially when I was in England on my own, I had no friends, like it helped me develop a bit of a family. And um, so it's given me so much back. So although there are sacrifices I need to make, I feel like the return I get is much, much more. Mm. Mm. But too far for you would be living an off season life, even during your game phase. Yeah, it's like what um, I, I, I was in a JT yeah. seminar Sorry. years ago and he said that you're always on prep that's the mentality whether you're in a muscle building phase or in a fat loss phase you're always on prep and I just don't feel like that I don't want to feel like I'm on prep all the time and that's what allows me to be mentally ready to prep for a show because I've taken that time away I've loosened the reins I've been a normal person uh without feeling like I need to eat out of Tupperware all day every day year round to say no to drinks to say no to food and just to to turn down things that will add to my life mm. Mm. yeah okay but yeah. you, you still do the important things, even when you're in a game phase. I was still, I, I never missed a training session my whole off season. I never missed a cardio session. You know, steps sometimes were plus or minus. Um, but in terms of the things that, that mean a lot to me, which are socializing, eating out, sharing meals with friends, that's something I did quite a lot because that's what I really, really enjoy. The other stuff I enjoy as well. So I didn't mind maintaining my training, maintaining my cardio because it made me feel good. Um, but 
I just I love that spirit sharing like meal experiences like in terms of like say off plan meals for example if I were to have an off plan meal I would never just order a takeaway and eat it at home it has to be an experience for me it has to be with people I love with company I enjoy with good atmosphere like that really really means a lot to me and adds a lot to my life and so that's something I wouldn't want to give up all year round I always encourage the flex success guys to not think of eating out as bad, but more so something that adds to your social life. Mm. We don't Mm. want to be eating out because of a lack of preparation. Um, And that's exactly your mentality. You're not going to just like order out and eat at home. (laughs) It's only when it adds to your social life. Imagine like going to like a drive through and just getting something to go or just ordering like a random takeaway Chinese at home. Like I just, I wouldn't find any pleasure from that. Um, So it would have to be like in specific situations. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Do you think that there is a objective line that's too much? Or do you think what is too much, like too much of a sacrifice in order to reach a fitness goal? Do you think that's more subjective? It's definitely not objective. Like there are people that are willing to go to the nth degree to achieve what they want, whether that's risking their lives or their families or their relationships. Um, so I think it is completely subjective based on you and what your values are and your, your morals as a person. Mm. And it's yeah. easy to judge people's uh, choices based off your current moral position, right? So like if someone's willing to sacrifice more than you, someone, you know, somebody with your particular mindset might go, that's too much. But we understand that like, well, no, everybody has different values and is willing to pull on strings a little bit more. Yeah, the biggest thing for me in these kinds of conversations is the question of whether or not that person's tried to have a little bit of an internal dialogue around, with themselves around like what it truly means to make the decisions they're making. Like I'm more interested in the why than I am in the actual action. Yeah, like have you thought about the costs? Yeah, so like you mentioned, like a young guy, extremely gifted, has turned pro in bodybuilding and has the opportunity now to make this a living, you know? is he willing to sacrifice a girlfriend? And somebody might, no, you should never sacrifice a relationship. And he might be like, well, actually, don't care, you know? And uh, uh, although it may sound harsh that he chose bodybuilding over, you know, a partner, I'm more of the opinion that it's about, like, what is the conversation you've had before you've made that decision that that is okay for you to do? Yeah. And then whether or not it's had sound reasoning and some people and don't and, like prioritize relationships as much as other people. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the problem, the problem we have, I think was when it goes too far is when the individual puts their head in the sand and they lose a relationship because of a prep yeah. without knowing that it's really happened or not consciously had that conversation. Or gaslighting themselves. No, they left because they're a bitch. Not because. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, so I'm more interested in the that that internal dialogue than I am anything else because yeah. I agree with you, Holly. I don't think it's objective. It's very hard. Yeah, and also like we, unlike you know fitness and health, bodybuilding is not conducive to longevity. Um, so it's not something that everyone's going to be in for the long run. So maybe someone like you said who's willing to sacrifice having a relationship right now, maybe he knows that in five years' time he will have retired from bodybuilding and he can wor- worry about it then. Um, because you know there is a finite time limit you have on bodybuilding Um, so I think a lot of people think of it in that way as well well I would probably think about people who identify as bodybuilders in two different camps there's competitive bodybuilders who definitely sacrifice some of their health for their goals and then there's people who practice the sport of building muscle or building their body that don't actually compete Yeah. And I would consider myself in that camp. And I think if anything, my pursuits are adding to my physiological health uh, because, you know, I'm maintaining my muscle mass as I get older. I'm maintaining my strength. I'm exercise is really healthy for the body. And in order to maintain a body composition I'm I'm happy with, I am keeping my calories under control and and my weight and I'm eating fruits and vegetables to manage my hunger and and make doing that easier. So So do you think one or the other uh, is okay to sacrifice more for them? Like, that's... does being the competitor open yourself to it being okay to sacrifice more because of the competitive component of it? Or do you think that you could be, you could sacrifice just as much by living the lifestyle without doing the competing? I don't think you need to sacrifice very much to just be a recreational bodybuilder because the goal isn't as extreme. Mm. 
like you're just going to the gym three to five times a week. You're eating relatively calorie controlled, quote unquote, healthy meals. Like, yeah, if they take more of the flexible approach that Holly's spoken about on this podcast. Oh, okay. But if they dove in on the bodybuilding lifestyle, like, you know, I eat my six meals, I eat them at this time. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. I train there this are, session. There are like non-competitors who are very obsessive with their structure and routine and they, they live like that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So my question is, is, that, is it okay for them to sacrifice just as much? Right, okay. Despite not being competitive? In my subjective opinion, I think that I can understand or think it's justifiable the sacrifices that competitive bodybuilders make because the end goal is quite extreme. But if you're just like trying to look good naked and you're sacrificing your entire life, I personally objectively think that's too far. Mm. Mm. What do you think, Holly? I've got, a, I've got an opinion that's going to split three ways. Okay. What, like, it, like, are you saying like you, you think there is an objective, objective way to assess whether something is too far? Not so much that there's an objective way to assess it, but whether or not, like, if you're a, so let's just, the two camps you've got now is a competitive bodybuilder and a lifestyle bodybuilder. Okay. So let's, it, should a lifestyle bodybuilder be willing to sacrifice just as much as a competitive bodybuilder to achieve that? Like, I, yeah, I would say no, but then again, it depends on that person and their, what they value as success. Because if they are a recreational bodybuilder, but they go to a gym that's surrounded by competitors, then their perception of what success is going to be different than someone who just works nine to five and goes to a commercial gym with other people who are, you know, just normal general population. Yeah. So I'm going to split them into three and say that we have competitive bodybuilders, those who compete, recreational or lifestyle. And then I'm going to say like, uh, I'll call them professional bodybuilders. Okay. In that people who make people their who income. live the lifestyle but make an income from what they do. Okay. Yeah. I would say that the level of sacrifice that can be justified would only go up as we go up the ranks from recreational to competitive to then professional. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think the sacrifice that recreational believe is necessary is often misappropriated. Yeah. And they do run the risk, like you said, Holly, is if they're in a gym surrounded by people that are either professional and or competitive. Uh, competitive is that they think that's what's necessary for them to live their life. Mm. But rather they can be more like what we've actually spoken about on this podcast. Like they can have the framework nailed. They can just have some flexibility in that. But then mm. the, the person who's seeking the professional outcome may need to sacrifice a little bit for a while in order to get that income flowing and also make something for themselves. And then the competitive obviously has like time specific sacrifice. Mm. Um, and then if it's like extra, extra professional, like literally legitimately pro, then maybe you might be willing to sacrifice more for a short period of time. Yeah. And I would be okay with that so long as the person knows what they're dealing with. Yeah. As long as they're aware of what they're doing and why and the potential consequences and they're willing to, to accept that. Mm. Mm. I just think too many people like uh, recreational bodybuilders, is that what we're calling them? think that the key to happiness is having the perfect body yeah and yeah. they sacrifice everything in the pursuit of what they believe to be the perfect body and we know that like happiness isn't a state it's not like when i get the house or i get the body or i get the thing it's like firstly i don't think happiness should be the pursuit at all it should be a fulfilling life and like exercise and health would be part of that when people do end up reaching and a goal, even an extreme goal, they might be really happy for a short period of time because they're so proud of everything they did and blah, blah, blah. But ask, check in in a week and see how they're doing. Mm. And they're probably no longer a 10 on the happiness scale. They're probably yeah. like your regular seven again. And yeah. they're looking at the next goal. Like, well, I could be even leaner again. I, yeah. I could get even more Instagram likes. I could, you know, there's always something else. So there's nothing wrong with having a physique goal, but just don't hang everything on it. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it's a moving goal post, like once you get to your initial goal, you're going to look beyond that and say, what's next? What's next? What's next? And you're really never going to be fully satisfied with how you look then because it's just it's just going to keep getting more and more extreme. I think that attitude is how we got to space. You know, like we used to live in caves and it was amazing when, when we found out we could control fire. And then what's next and what's next? Like now we're in space. What is going it to is be kind of like an inherent trait of humans to always look for more and progression yeah yeah mm. which is why i think having gratitude for what we are is so important and the closest i think uh we should be getting to a happy state 
is not wanting what we don't have, but wanting what we do have, like being grateful mm. for mm. what's in our life now. Like I want the morning sun. I want my nice coffee. Like I want to have good conversations with Dean. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't progress, but also being grateful for, for what exists. Yeah. And yeah, ha- happiness is not a bikini body. Yeah. And also yeah. if you're grateful for what exists and will likely not disappear, e.g. Mm. the sun, the ability to eat food, the ability to have relationships, you're setting yourself up for long-term success as opposed to being happy due to materialistic uh, gain. Right. You know, things that can be taken away can cause problems. Or a transient body. Yeah, mm. yeah or a transient yeah. body, exactly. Yeah. Mm, hot topic. I, hot to topic, hot to topic. <laughs> <laughs> to topic, That's very good. To topic. I enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, I said to Dean, I want to find the, the music for Hot Potato, but without the lyrics, and I'll, like, really poorly sing Hot to Top over the top of it. Mm. Um, I wonder so, if there's been a karaoke rendition before. I'm sure there has been. <laughs> it's got to be. Maybe. Watch out on the next episode after you for Hot to Topic music. It might I look be. forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see if I win the debate. I might even get myself a whole soundboard after. Like, oh, that would be cool. Traveling is the current. You could probably actually download a soundboard on your iPad. Yeah, you probably have it on an app. Yeah, there'd be an app for it. Oh, for sure. I'm going to look or I'm going to tell the assistant to look because yeah. I don't do technology. <laughs> uh, anyways, Polly, we finish every episode with a, with a would you rather. Okay. I don't plan them in advance. Mm. So <laughs> let's see what happens, unless you've got one for Holly. No, often when I try and go off cuff, it doesn't. His would you rather's don't even make sense. When you- <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't think off the cuff. Like, I just can't. I'm not like a spontaneous person. I need to be prepared. So what I would come up with would probably be shy as well. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, I've got two. One of them has to do with lifestyle sacrifices. The other one has to do with okay. food. Which would you prefer? Okay. Oh, God, you picked. Surprise me. Dean, who or lifestyle? lifestyle okay would you rather have to live your comp prep life for 80 percent of the year or for 10 months for 10 months of the year you live in comp prep restrictions Mm -hmm. or live the life that you live now but never really get in like the crispest you're like your best possible uh stage body you always think i could have been a little bit more conditioned no, I'd 100% go for 80% of the year dieting. Would you? Track. Yeah, absolutely. I like the thought of getting on stage, not looking my best every single time. Like it would absolutely destroy me. It would drive me crazy. So no, never. I didn't I'd think you were going to go that way. I didn't think No, so. happily, happily. Because the thing is like, although I love my off seasons, my, my flexibility there, I really thrive productively off being in a deficit and dieting. It gives me like a lot of mental clarity, especially for the initial few weeks of dieting. So at the moment I feel way more productive than I ever felt when I was in off season. Um, so I would much rather feel like this 80% of the time. I couldn't imagine like always missing the mark every single time. It would just drive me mad. Okay. I'd never compete. <laughs> <laughs> so you would choose to be like comp prep strict 80 percent of the year as well yeah yeah i know yeah. you dean doesn't really oh. mind prepping it doesn't really ruin him like it ruins other people no, but no, I don't think so. no i'm like i have a, a genuine fear of not making it on stage yeah it's, every it's time hard. until i've gotten off it and i look back and i went I oh i did I it <laughs> you know like hey you won the england title he did it's all right. like literally though it's it's up until the week and then it's the day and then it's the two that three day and then i'm like fuck it we've still got two more days like this could just go yeah. i could just completely implode you know yeah. <laughs> oh i love it yeah <laughs> well um thank you for coming on the podcast holly it was a good discussion wasn't it yeah i sound yeah, surprised having me yeah yeah it was a very interesting discussion it was, it was. Uh, where can people find you should they wish to I mean, we kind of already put it all down on the on the share, but yeah, we already discussed it. But yeah, anyway, if you want to follow me on Instagram or at Holly Davidge, uh, you can find me on the Physique Collective member site, uh, where I am, as I said, the head of exercise mechanics. But I also give a lot of other information on, as I said, uh, traveling and uh, training and everything like that. Um, I also have my own podcast, which is Elevate HD, which you can find on Apple. Spotify and YouTube um, I'm also an online coach so if you are interested in coaching then you can just drop me a message on Instagram and I'd be happy to have a chat amazing too easy until next mm. time guys thank you